That's interesting. You talk about predators, coyotes, and, and it elicits a really strong reaction. Um, usually not favorable of the coyotes or predators. And, um, it, you know, I, I don't really try to shy away from controversy. So, um, because I really want to help you understand and at least to what I've experienced and what I've been taught and uh, and sometimes it goes against the grain because I find in the hunting community that things have been tried and true and passed on for generations that are just flat out wrong um, and, and things that hurt people for hunting uh, you know even phrases I uh, can't kill them from the couch you know things like that that have saved more deer than ever um, you know just what's what's the one on the wind Dylan I can't think uh forget about the wind just hunt and uh however that goes but bottom line is a lot of sayings that have been passed down that really hurt hunters that have saved bucks lives for for many uh many decades and so when it comes to predator control when it comes to crossbows versus compounds when it comes to heavy arrows versus light there's a lot of buzzwords out there that really get people fired up and i wanted to talk about coyotes today and give you a different light on this you can do what you want you know the coyotes i really don't care um your approach with wolves bears uh whatever it might be bottom line is i want to just talk about what's worked for me and what's worked for others uh, with our clients and what we do and uh, what we've seen consistently throughout the years and maybe apply that you might have a different perspective and uh, it, but bottom line is you, you might help yourself a little bit better what does science say now you can understand like with with me and mature buck behavior and buck behavior deer behavior in general is another thing that's helped mislead a lot of hunters is the science says one thing common sense and experience says another so when people are going to school for deer biology and developing their masters in wildlife biology based in deer and deer management deer deer research all the research that is done out there really doesn't help the average hunter in any way in fact it goes against what the average hunter is seen because most of the research is done on large properties fenced properties large public land holdings large commercial forestry loads and we're talking thousands of acres or more it has nothing to do with the average hunter out there that's hunting on small parcel fragmented parcels and it could be a 500 acre parcel so not even necessarily small, but still a 500 acre parcel doesn't apply to science and how far a buck moves. Think about the number of property borders that a, a buck will cross in the average setting that has 40, 80, 100 acres, 20 acre parcels. If it moves a half mile during daylight, like it would on public land, it just crossed five fence lines, was exposed to 15 hunters and probably wouldn't make it past the age of two. Where on public land in a remote area, it could move miles and not see a hunter. Totally, totally different. Bucks really shrink their daylight movement on private land. So when you look at science, you think, ah, you know, science for predators. The science shows you that when, and there could be a lot of factors to this, but just talk about it though. When a, when a couple of males are taken out of the pack, then females will increase their litter size from two to three pups to 10 to 12 pups. So all of a sudden you have a population explosion because you just shot a couple of them. Better off, from what I've seen, and even science, shoot all of them if you can. But in then two or three years, you're right back at it. But still, shoot all of them. You can keep them under keep them under control then, or shoot nothing at all. People think, wow, shoot nothing at all. How could you do that? But if you don't want to explode the population with larger litter size, then science tells you to do that. Another thing science tells you that's interesting is, and it does apply to some recommendations I give you, is that they followed. It was right around 50 fawns in a Pennsylvania study. 24 were killed by predators during that study in that first summertime when they were fawns. They found that three or four were killed by bear. Three or four were actually killed by bobcat. And then they had about 17, 18, 19 that were killed by coyote. And the coyotes, the coyote numbers weren't surprising. What was surprising is the number of fawns that were exposed to predation. You think about it, they did this study in large public land holdings, federal holdings, where there's not a lot of cover. Basically cover is a blown down log in the woods, not really growth regeneration. So these fawns were kind of sitting ducks. But even then, they only got half of them. That's in bad habitat, that's worst case scenario. So you're going to say, you know, science says one thing. You know, again, talk about, you know, timber management, open woods, road kills, litter size. You know, another thing is science shows with uh, coyotes just really quick before we move on here to what does common sense say, which is not always what science says. But the number one time where people will find, people study coyotes, when they find deer hair and coyote scat is during the rut. 
because that's when the road car collisions excel. And the other time is in the spring. All those times when there's not much green happening in the woods, but the green is, is really starting to show alongside the roads and there's a lot of deer car collisions during that time. Well, that's another time coyote scat peaks and deer. So they're opportunistic. They're feeding on a lot of dead deer at that time. That's the number one and two time that you find actually deer in the hair. So you find that they're eating during these times, but they're feeding on road kills. They're not actually feeding on live deer. Common sense, common sense says, think about this. Think about in your area. You know, a lot of times, now if you're only seeing one fawn or less per doe during the hunting season, you know, October especially, then you might have a predation problem. But if you have high deer numbers, does might be limiting how many fawns they have in their womb. They do that during the winter time based on a lack of food and cover like they do up north. You know, up north it's common to only have 0.5 fawns per doe going into the season. And a lot of that has to do with they have harsh winters and there's a degree of winter kill. And the way that mother survives is she basically aborts that fawn during the winter time. And it's a way of making sure that the remaining fawn is healthy and to make it through and uh, leads to lower fawn recruitment rates. You know, an average area in ag might be 2.2 fawns on average per, per every doe. So if you're seeing that, common sense says, you know, you're worried about fawns being killed by coyotes, but you're seeing one and a half to two fawns per doe on average, then you must not have a fawn or a coyote problem because the, one, the number one time they're gonna get those is when they're young. When they get older, they have a really hard time taking down this year's fawn, let alone last year's yearling deer, or even a mature doe, and certainly a mature buck, unless they're wounded in some way. That's common sense. You know, another thing common sense talks about is the amount of cover and the amount of small game habitat you have, and we'll talk about that in a second. Build better habitat. That's the problem, too. A lot of our government programs lead to predation. Let me repeat that. Professional management, CRP, Timber management, professional timber management leads to predation because of the lack of cover. So when you have CRP fields that are laying down in the wintertime in November, December, January, February, March, and there's no cover there, then not only is there no cover for deer, not even talking deer, fawns, does, whatever it might be, there's no cover for small game, grouse, pheasants, rabbits. What about mice? Maybe there's some mice living under the snow down there, but if you don't have a lot of cover, they're exposed to birds of prey. So it can get really slim in most CRP fields because there's a lack of cover going throughout the winter time. That has a direct result of does or coyotes, predators in general, having to turn their attention elsewhere. What about professional timber stand improvement? Select cut. I've seen a lot of select cut on property where the canopy is only open for five to seven years after the cutting and you don't get that herbaceous growth down below because it's shaded. There's nothing there. So there's no cover down below. So when there's no cover, not only do you not, again, have cover for the critters, you don't have cover for fawns, so they're more exposed. So those are two problems. You know, people say, well, I have county problem, problem, but you have all open timber and you have CRP that's laying down in the winter. That's your problem, not the coyotes. Coyotes won't get a high percentage of those fawns if you actually have decent habitat. So a lot of times that's a direct focus of habitat. I never saw fawn kills up in the UP of Michigan when I lived there for 14 years. We averaged over one fawn for every doe because we actually had habitat and we actually had diversity. I actually had thick cover, a lot of conifer, shrubs growing, regeneration. So fawns could easily escape predators. We had wolves up there and we had bobcats and they even say we had cougars. Still over one fawn per doe going into the season. You have to build small game. Think about building small game populations. Out here we have lots of rabbits. We actually have grouse. We have pheasant. We have turkeys, young and old. We have lots of critters, squirrels, Everything else, chipmunks. Lots of targets for coyotes that are easier than running down a fawn, let alone a middle-aged deer, older deer, teenage deer, whatever you want to refer to it as. Those are hard to catch. A lot harder to catch small game and hunt for small game and be successful with small game. And that ends up a large percentage of a predator's diet. Same thing applies to wolves, bears. Only difference is wolves. If they want that deer dead, they're going to kill it. Wolves are opportunistic. A lot of clients that I deal with that have problems with them have a pack of three to five moving through, and when they move through, the deer are gone. Not much you can do about it, but the deer come back because they weren't killed. Again, they're opportunistic. Say the average wolf will 
wolf will kill about 20 deer and eat 20 deer a year. Primarily, there's studies, not studies, but observations that go different, but you have to worry about observations because people that are slanted in their prejudice towards wolves or not will come out with bad observations. Just the way it works about anything in life. You know, if you look at the political arena, not even talking about one side or the other, but each side comes up with and slings all kinds of garbage at the other that the other is doing based on their observations and their interpretation. It's the same with wolves. So wolves, there's been stories that they'll just kill for the fun of it. You think about that. These are really smart creatures that are very efficient with their movements and their expenditure of energy. They don't want to run down deer and kill them and then just leave them and not eat them. It doesn't even make sense if you think about it. But they kill about 20 deer a year on average. That's a lot. I want you to bring up something. We thought I was, we had a wolf expert come in and talk to us in the mid-2000s in Munising, Michigan. And at that time, they said the wolf population had been built up to about 500 wolves, 400 wolves in the UP of Michigan, which is a lot because some of those wolves have been collared down and killed in Missouri, lower Michigan, Illinois. They travel a long way. So when you have 500 in the UP, that's a lot because they have a big range. They run into each other. But bottom line is, some were saying as high as 700. But over a 15 year period, there was zero to begin with. Let's say there were 700. Let's say there were 700 every year. If you do the math, it resulted in about 14, is that 1400 deer? Uh, I'm trying to think here. 14,000 deer killed per year, something like that, was 700 wow. over a 15 or 10 year period. It would've been 140,000 deer killed during that 10 year period and through mid 90s to mid 2000s. It's about 140,000 deer. That's a lot over a 10 year period. But over that 10 year period, 1.1 million were killed by hunters and 900,000 were killed by the winter severity. Two million. And I'm not saying 140,000 is not a lot, but in perspective of things that actually matter, you know, things that are controllable, you know, the weather can't control, but the winter severity kills 50% of all fawns, which is about 50,000 fawns a year in the winter. Guess what eats those dead fawns or dying fawns? Wolves. So a lot of the deer that were gonna die anyways by the weather, the wolves eat, coyotes eat, just nature, the way it works. A lot of people worry about bears. You know, bears coming through, they have a powerful nose, pick out fawns. Bears aren't very fast, and they can't turn a corner very fast. So when those fawns actually get old enough, two or three weeks to really run hard and escape, they will. They can be found when they're young. Well, bears have such a powerful nose, they can walk right up to them. That's literally like finding a needle in a haystack. And they do it, it is amazing, I think, that Pennsylvania study, study, one or two were killed by bears. They had bobcats, coyotes, those are major predators. Bottom line is, when it comes to coyote control, a lot of people are quick to blame coyotes. I put an Instagram video of a coyote that walked up to us in the deer blind in Saskatchewan hunting this year. A lot of people, I said I should have shot it without a tag, illegally. Shoot everything, shoot every coyote that moves. They don't worry about the coyotes up there in any way. They worry about the wolves. They worry about the bears coming into the bait and spooking the deer off. They worry about wolves. We heard several wolves packs, you know, all around, kind of like lowest hole in the bucket if you're worrying about coyotes you probably have a lot of other problems to worry about first and a lot of it comes down to, to habitat so a lot of you out there with private land you're worrying about coyotes hey around here we're seeing more bucks than we do does and fawns for the most part and so more different antlered bucks than does and fawns i don't care if i'm only seeing one fawn per every doe and a half somewhere you know doe one and a half fawns, one fawn. That's okay for, to me, fawn recruitment going into the winter time. Less does that we have to shoot, more bucks on the property, more balanced herd. We get to enjoy a really quality herd. You know, some people around here have standing beans all summer. They have greens and they're seeing 35 does and fawns in two bucks. I'd rather be, I'd rather see seven or eight bucks and 10 does and fawns. And that's a function of how much food you have. It has nothing to do with, you know, during the summertime food, creating those doe factories. It has nothing to do with predators. The bottom line is those predators, yeah, they can kill a few deer here and there. The best way to combat that, you can either kill them all, which is one method, get to be very diligent at it every single year, many times out during the season. You're not gonna go out and kill all your coyotes on your property with just one time out. And think about the overlap where they're coming from neighboring properties too. Know that if you stop, they will be back and replenish that area within just a couple short years. But bottom line is you can do it. Just be very diligent, hit it over and over again or do nothing at all, which is what I choose to do because I have other things to worry about and we have incredible deer herds to hunt with older age bucks and, and great deer herds. 
Um, and, and, and so we've seen these great deer herds and deer herds that are clients without doing anything at all. But the number one thing, because we do nothing at all when it comes to shooting them, is we increase the habitat, we increase small game populations, and that ultimately is increasing the amount of food. Now, I, I can't wait to go out and trap some coyotes this year. We'll have fun doing that. That's more of an activity that we'll go out and do, and I think it'll be a cool project for us. Um, it'd be great to get rid of coyotes, raccoons, possums on the property because they're all nest robbers and eating turkey eggs. That's probably compare you know care about that more. But bottom line is build your small game population. Maybe if you want to go really take out those coyotes, maybe think about taking them all out instead of just one or two and improving and, and exploiting the population. Kind of give that yourself a blend of common sense and science. And when, when you're thinking about it, you know, when it comes to herd management, deer management, as it relates to hunting, that's what we're doing anyways. You're looking at what's common sense say, what's science say, what's experience say, and then you're going in with an effective game plan for effective predator control as opposed to just listening. You should go through those counts on my Instagram. The same thing, White Tail Habitat Solutions, or look up Jeff Sturgis, you'll find it. Look under the coyote one where it walks right up to our pop-up and moves on. You see some of the comments in there. I'll just say misinformed is the best way to put it. Um, there's some people in there that would believe a coyote never does anything wrong, and then there's other people in there that think to the scourge of the earth and break the law to shoot them any chance you get. They're, they range all between, and there's hundreds of comments. I urge you to check that out too. But bottom line is, there's a lot of opportunity to effectively not only ward off the effects of predation, but if you're improving wildlife on your property, you know, rabbits, grouse, Pheasants are one of the three main indicator species that you have great, not only wildlife habitat on your property, but whitetail habitat too. Focus on that, and I think all roads lead to success when you take that road as a trying to blame this or blame that over there. Work on your habitat improvement, work on the small game populations on your property, and you'll find that the predator control and, the, and your assumptions that predators are making a big difference will really fall to the wayside. Now, I want to really take the time to to mention our Hills and Thermal web class. You know, it's a really important web class. Dylan thinks it's our best web class, but- you see um, some of the graphics in there. <laughs> and that's why. <laughs> and I think one of the things, the cool thing, we did like a multi-layered approach. So I draw out the land features on the whiteboard here, and then we go out to the site in the woods to talk about it. And then we'd use drone footage to talk about it. And then HuntWise aerial imagery and photographs. Aerial imagery. Yes. Beautiful. Which you can turn around and look at. It's beautiful. So Dylan did a great job putting that all together. Uh, we took the time to do all those different layers to make sense of it. But anybody who hunts in hills and has to deal with thermals, which is about 50% of you out there, this class will be really, really important for you. Not only going into hunt next year, but really how you set up your land. So it's a very important web class. It's probably our best one that we've done. It's very complete. And uh, we actually have one more to add which you might do the next time we film. Uh, we're running out of time today, but um, it's one that we just, are, I wanna add because I think it's an important feature to add, even though we've gone over this. But bottom line is, I urge you guys to check that out. And, um, and then once you purchase a web class, all the subsequent purchase of our web class, we have four all together, are 20% off. So um, we thank you for purchasing them. Those of you that checked it out, we have a private Facebook page. I'm gonna mention that private Facebook page too. You have to, it's, it's a clunky process on Facebook. It's their, kind of their problem. You have to let us know, let Jesse know. That's where all these emails come through. Um, Jen gets involved sometimes too, but we have to actually request you to be a friend or you have to request us. It's under WHS Jeff, Jeff WHS. I think is the uh, Jeff WHS is the page, but we'll let you know, we can request you as a friend once we're accepted as friends, then we can invite you to the class. We can't invite you to the class because you won't be able to see it unless we're friends first. So once we're friends, we can do that. Invite you to that private Facebook page. We have a lot of good discussion on there. You know, there's not a lot of members on there. There's a few hundred members. So I urge you to check that out. Enjoy the hat and workbook that we send with that and uh, the eBooks if you don't have them already. And uh, those are a lot of resources to help you improve your hunt this year, whether you're developing your habits to, habitat to ward off predators, or you're actually learning how to really take some advanced hunting and scouting efforts in hills and thermals. That'll help you this year and I urge you to check it out. And uh, really, again, attack your habitat, and that's the best way to fight off these predators every single season.